Welcome to Starkey Sound Bites. I'm your host, Dave Fabry, Starkey's Chief Hearing Health Officer. Here at Starkey, our mission is to serve our customers better than anybody else. It's something we talk about a lot, but we really don't often get into the how and why of it. So there's no one better to do that than our mm. chief customer officer, Chris Van Gilder. And Chris, I really appreciate your being with us here today. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's uh, great to be a guest on the podcast. We recently won two awards for our customer service. So timely opportunity to have a discussion with you. And I'm excited about where we are and where we're headed. Fantastic. I love yeah. having you for as, as the first time guest on this. Yes, so we're hoping that guest. you can aim for a, a five-timer jacket in the future. <laughs> but uh, but this is the first, I think, of many conversations. But in the interest of customer service, mm -hmm. uh, for our listeners of this yep. podcast, uh, if you enjoy this episode or in past episodes, we ask you to subscribe or like the episode, uh, share it with your friends. And uh, if you have ideas, we'd also encourage you to submit to us at uh, soundbites at starkey.com uh, if you have ideas for future topics on the, the podcast. But with that, I want to turn to the topic of the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said, chief customer officer, serving our customers better than anybody else is our mission. Mm -hmm. um, talk about what, who is our customer? Talk about Starkey's customer that we're serving. Is that the practitioner? Is it the end user mm -hmm. or something else? Well, you, uh, you hit it right on the head there, Dave. It is a little bit of both. So primarily, we do serve the practitioner. Um, over the last several years, we have seen an increase in our consumer or patient support as well as patients appreciate an opportunity to call into us directly and receive some support as well after they've had a fitting and are working through maybe some connectivity or some other uh, potential questions that might come up. So we get about 370 phone calls a day wow. from the, uh, the consumer, the end user, but also primarily um, our customer that we serve and have sought to serve for the past 60 years better than anyone else is the practitioner that our probably largely the majority of your audience listening to this today. Excellent. Well, yeah, I think that it's it's really a reflection of the change mm -hmm. um, in the products that now many of the products are connected to smartphones. Mm -hmm. uh, there's features that um, really have uh, compounded uh, the challenge for, let's say, a first time user. We aim to make that product and the delivery of that mm -hmm. as, as seamless as possible. But I think it's, it's reassuring to know that uh, not only are we trying to provide the best tools for the practitioner, the audiologist, the dispenser, mm -hmm. but then again, mm -hmm. to be able to field some of those questions directly mm -hmm. from the end user if uh, the, you know, the professional uh, uh, would like to have them and have us serve as a, as a backstop for mm -hmm. them to help ease that transition. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, we, we strive to make everything as efficient and easy to use as possible uh, throughout the organization, everything that we release. Uh, at times, of course, there are folks with questions. And so those consumers will call in. And I'm really proud of our consumer support team. It is a lot of technical support. And uh, one of the unique um, uh, things about that team and the work they do is sometimes the length of the phone call, for example. So you talk about the dedication and how it might help our other customers, the practitioner with, um, uh, you know, supporting them and their patients. We'll take calls that can sometimes take up to two hours to wow. just help them out, walk them through step by step to make sure that they're comfortable with whatever new product or device that they may have purchased and uh, hopefully have them on their way to a really exciting experience. And again, and providing that value to our other customers so that uh, not that they wouldn't want to deal with that, but it's another value add service that Starkey provides for all of the customers that that we serve. Yeah, I think it's so important and we can support all of that. But is there anything we else do. with regards to customer service sure. uh, that you can define, if you will, <laughs> within your role? Well, at, at a high level. So one of the things that for me um uh, goes to the value of customer service. We have both the proximity to the customer, of course, but then our position in the organization. So not just at Starkey, but really any company, large or small, customer service is typically at the epicenter between operational teams, 
and the market facing teams. So while yes, we're on the front lines, of course, we're often dealing with reacting to responding to or resolving a consequence of a decision that was made or a product that was released well before we got that phone call. So we're in a unique position within the organization that contributes to our overall shared success. So it's no surprise that our founder, Bill Austin, it was no accident that he wanted to focus on that as a competitive advantage. And that's precisely what he's done and and the legacy that we strive to uphold in really positioning customer service as a competitive advantage for both, Mm -hmm. you know, for Starkey overall. Yeah, and I hear that from our customers, those uh, hearing care professionals all the time, that they love uh, customer service and customer Mm -hmm. support from Starkey and the way that it's provided. And we'll dive Mm -hmm. into that a little bit more. But what I'm hearing first and foremost is teamwork is Mm -hmm. really essential to this and communication across a broad swath of Mm -hmm. the organization. I think that's central. If if what I'm hearing you say, you you really need to have that breadth of Mm -hmm. of, uh, interaction Mm -hmm. and connection throughout Mm -hmm. the organization. Yeah, absolutely. So as you noted, our mission statement at Starkey is to serve our customers better than anyone else. And that is not an aspirational goal or a vision for the future. It's what we do today. And it's why 5,000 employees around the world get up five days a week to go to work, regardless of their job title or their geography. And that's something that we as an organization have aligned around and because we know the importance of it. Uh, we've looked at external studies. Harvard Business Review did one of 75,000 consumers where they found, by and large, the number one factor that customers want is quality level of service, mm-hmm. far beyond uh, product features or even price. So you look at the things that can separate you, can differentiate you, we know that customer service is one of them. And, you know, at Starkey, we had that advantage, um, again, that Bill Austin founded us upon 60 years running. As an organization, we are aligned to it. We have bought in. And as a result, we work very, very well with players throughout the organization to be very proactive in delivering the highest quality customer service at any point in time. Indeed. And I'd like to to pivot <clears throat> slightly, I mean, to, to consider the fact that most of our listeners are uh, many of our listeners at least are small business owners yep. uh, as well as practitioners and so when you're talking about customer mm-hmm. service supporting an organization of 5,000 professionals that may seem you know a, a very long ways away mm-hmm. from what many small business owners are doing but mm-hmm. the reality is many of these principles really are the blocking and tackling that come with any business and when mm-hmm. you, when you talk about this I mean it's often when you call the phone uh, call up on the phone the phone is still the yeah. way that many end users interface uh, with their customers uh, and their providers if you will mm-hmm. that receptionist who answers the phone is their first point of contact. Shed a little light on the way that Starkey views this differently than the rest of the industry. Uh, I I know many times when I call for customer service Mm for uh, entities, I'm getting a recording. Yes, so you're you're definitely not wrong about that. So we live in a world today where uh, companies, regardless of industry and regardless of size, are moving away from service with a human touch, that live voice that we value so much. Uh, I spoke to, you know, we take 2,000 calls a day. Yeah. They are answered by a live voice, typically within five seconds. Mm-hmm. And then within 50 seconds, you are transferred to the appropriate person who can handle your inquiry based on what you provided to that operator. And I love the fact that our operators know most of our customers by name and vice versa because we've established that relationship. So that that's incredibly important to us. And, you know, that that works obviously at scale for us, but the same principle applies to the smaller businesses, maybe many of those folks listening today in their own practices. It's getting close to the customer, understanding what they need and getting really grounded in how uh, the products you provide, the service you provide, that experience impacts them, whether successfully or poses a challenge as well. So you can we apply that principle to a large company like Starkey, and it can easily be applied. And something that I would encourage people to do is view the experience through the lens of their customer. And I think you'll find at a lot of those touch points that you have some opportunities for improvement. Uh, That's something that we sat down and looked at. I've had this role uh, twice previously on an interim or transitional basis and now fully um, in my current capacity. And each time, one of the first things I did was just sit down, get on the phones with our service professionals and understand what does their day look like? What are the tools they're using? And then how is it impacting the customer? 
and helping them get what they want to do. And that's something that anybody listening can do, regardless of the size of your business. You want the customer's happiness to be the end goal. And when you look at it through that perspective and stay grounded in that mindset, you'll find a lot of opportunity for improvements and some areas in which you excel. And then you can double down on those as part of your advantage that you provide in your clinic, in your community, in your marketplace. Yeah, and I I, I think that's so well stated. And it's often the case for many of our customers, the Mm -hmm. practitioners, um, when they're getting a phone call from a patient, um, it's often because there is a concern or a question Mm -hmm. or a problem. And and I can tell you from my personal experience, mm-hmm. uh, I'll call the toll free number sometimes when I'm traveling just mm-hmm. to see how quickly yeah. I get transferred. I'm clogging up your system, <laughs> but but I you're re- the one. I really appreciate how quickly you know a yes. friendly voice yep. helps diffuse any sort of anxiety yep. or concern that a patient is already experiencing. Mm-hmm. That's often why they're calling, and so I'm always amazed. You know, I hear a friendly voice that I recognize and who often recognizes me mm-hmm. right away. Yeah. On the on the line and there's nothing like that to really you know uh, help get the conversation on the right foot yeah a- absolutely um you know we it, it speaks to a point where a lot of companies they focus on in terms of training uh overly scripted call flows yeah. things that their agents have to follow the flow chart the complexity of process and procedure we don't train that way do we certainly have parameters and guidelines Absolutely. But we seek first to understand what is the nature of the call, appreciate their concern, use that empathy to understand how we can help them best. And then we give them the freedom, the autonomy, the empowerment to make that person's day. And often we found that um, whether it's a consumer calling in or one of our customers or even outside the industry, people really place a higher value on just getting the basics, the fundamentals, get them right. Nobody wants to be told, I don't know, on a simple status call inquiry or a fulfillment question. So everything we do is geared toward getting our trained agents the right amount of information, the right tools at their disposal. So we're not saying, I don't know, call back later, try again, let me transfer you. It's all about just understanding because we're all consumers in our own right. Mm -hmm. And we know the frustrations that we have in our daily lives. So how do we empower our service professionals to deal with them as quickly and efficiently as possible. Do you follow up with customers who call in mm-hmm. to see if their questions were uh, addressed the first yep. time? And yeah. you know, you, you talked about these very short wait times mm-hmm. from uh, you know from the time a person uh, first answers the call to when they get mm-hmm. routed to the correct individual. Yep. But then also, do we look at the outcomes that way? We do. So. Uh, two things. One, briefly to that point. So one, when I um, when I took over again the most recently, one of the things uh, that we looked to do was to provide more time for some outbound call time for the agents to follow up mm-hmm. with customers mm-hmm. that maybe they weren't able to answer something right away that first time, but get back to them same day, close the case out, resolve their issue or concern, whatever it may have been. And then secondly, I wanted to measure that. And it's easy, especially in this environment and customer service to to have data overload. I mean, you can measure, Mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of points of data daily, weekly, monthly, forward looking, rear view, it doesn't matter. And you can have kind of a paralysis by analysis. And so what I wanted to do is really narrow in on what are the actionable data that can help us drive better coaching and training, Mm -hmm. better hiring practices, and ultimately better outcomes. And one of those, to your point in the question, uh, first call resolution is something that we really focused on. I know you've heard me talk about this Mm -hmm. before, uh, but really the theory is uh, that I was kind of curious about, but then also there's a lot of value to measuring is how often are we able to respond uh, or resolve that inquiry the first time, close it out so they don't have to call back again. Mm -hmm. And that's beneficial, obviously, to the customer so that they clearly have a quick and efficient response. But then also it can feed some data. If we had a poor first call resolution rate, we can look at those cases and understand the why behind it. Now, bringing that again to Mm -hmm. our customers, how they can uh, benchmark in their own practices. How does this mean? That's something that they could, Mm -hmm. everyone feels like they're pressed for time. Everyone feels like they don't have enough time to do Mm follow-up. And yet to ensure that they're meeting the needs or exceeding the needs like like you're doing with your team of their customers. um, Are there some simple tips that you can offer as to how they bring that into their space? Yeah, certainly. So I view it as, Invest now to save later. 
And we, we put a lot of um, resources and time and attention into, you know, what is the preparation we need to conduct ahead of time to ensure a successful launch like Genesis AI, to ensure that we can handle any issues that might come up. And, and that goes back to something you touched on before of that internal alignment and communication. So, um, you know, our team leaders, our managers are constantly integrated and in speaking with um, representatives from product management, operations to marketing and sales, and understanding what might be coming that we need to address to get ahead of it. And one of the big things that I've stressed for our team and you know the customer service department is to adopt a proactive posture versus a reactive one. It's easy to sit back and let things happen to you, but if you assert a service mindset in the organization and say, no, we need to be part of the decision making, we need to be a part of the discussion, we need to inform that journey for that patient in that practice um, to achieve better outcomes. We've seen that pay dividends quite a bit, you know, in, in some of the measurements that we've talked about and beyond. So it, it comes down to really placing a high value on the importance of service, and that can manifest in different ways. Not everybody listening is going to have uh, a team of agents on the phone, yeah. you know, 140 of them or so on the phone, but service shows up in different ways. And going back to walking that journey and using that to inform decisions that you make in your practice to help then achieve better outcomes. And so, again, it's spending that time up front, that investment of time and resources. So then you can save that on the back end with less repeated inquiries or issues or frustrations that might come along. Excellent. So you said, again, um, 2,000 calls a day? 2,000 calls a day. And then is that in addition to the 375 that you mentioned from end users? Is no, that different team or same that, team? That or? is actually um, in addition to. Wow. So yeah. uh, it's quite the quite the number. Huge call volumes. Yeah, now, in addition to those calls coming in on the phone, uh, talk a little bit about your team. You, another, you have a, quite a few audiologists. We do. Uh, yeah. That can assist mm -hmm. the professional in the fitting process, if they would like. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about how that workflow goes and, and, and how, much, how much volume are we seeing with yeah, that every day? Absolutely. So I'm very proud of the fact that we have, uh, I believe the count now is 21 audiologists on our customer service staff alone. And I know Starkey obviously employs many other audiologists as well, but um, their dedication is to help uh, any customer who calls in and wants it, whether it's a uh, fitting in their clinic right then and there through our audiology on demand service, mm -hmm. or just help with product selection, um, identifying and working through maybe some frustrations or concerns that they've had and identifying the right solution for a patient or how to navigate maybe new products that we've launched. And so, um, you know, we do tens of thousands of those sessions and inquiries every single year, uh, just on that audiology team. Mm -hmm. We also have a team internally, we call it IIR. Um, really their, their focus is on, uh, in the custom products, which we all know Starkey as a competitive advantage mm -hmm. there as well. Um, when we see an issue in the build process of that, you know, through design modeling and the production of it, where we need to call back out and speak to the clinician and work through a best fit, a scenario that, you know, hey, what if we did this versus that? And, you know, that team, um, one thing that I'm really proud of, so that the reason they the, the inquiry gets flagged to that team is because there's an issue that needs to be resolved. So you've, you've started the clock to run from delaying that product, those hearing aids, mm -hmm. getting on the ears of somebody who needs hearing help. And over a year ago, um, not to anyone's fault, but that team had fallen behind a little bit in volume, and it was taking, in some cases, up to two weeks um, to close out that particular case and get that product back on the ears of a customer. Uh, we worked with them. We challenged some assumptions in the workflow and, and really held a, you know, a Kaizen event to really break it down and restructure how we work. And now we're on a two-day turnaround time. So that means we're helping people hear better in a much shorter amount of time. We're resolving those inquiries and we're working through them uh, to help the clinician move on um, in, in their practice and see more patients and spend less time with a fr potentially frustrated customer um, who doesn't have their hearing aids and, and get that resolved for them in a much, much quicker amount of time. 
Wow, fantastic to really shorten that delay. I mean, hearing aids are not an impulse purchase, but once people make right. the decision yep. to proceed, we want to keep that delay as short as possible Absolutely. and ensure that we're helping the professional mm -hmm. uh, uh, streamline that process so they can uh, help their patients uh, have better hearing and start that journey right away. Yeah, because that's that's the end goal, right? Is uh, you know we we say hear better, live better, right? Yeah. So, how how quickly and efficiently can we help people? In all walks of life, regardless of you know where they live and around the world, how can we implement best practices to ultimately get them hearing as best as possible as quickly as possible? That's fantastic. And the ability then to have one of those 21 audiologists or one of our mm -hmm. customer service team that mm -hmm. is experienced with understanding how the software can really serve as, as a... Um, an easement, if you will, for mm -hmm. new new practitioners to Starkey. If a professional is new to Starkey and they're fitting with ProFit with a patient, how do they call up uh, Audiology On Demand? Well, you can quite simply call Starkey's main number and just ask for audiology support, and we will get you in under a minute um, on board with um, one of those many audiologists that we have, and they'll be happy to help you out. So there are no special routing required, no special sign-up. Just call the 1-800 and let our operator know, and they'll get you to the right person. Wow, terrific. So talking a little bit about that, that, that uh, breadth throughout the organization, how it is that customer service provides important feedback from the market regarding that experience. I mean, and I think your team, those numbers that you shared are impressive with 93% overall, 98%, or even that 100% satisfaction first call resolution um, is amazing. But the feedback then also needs to come back internally to our teams to, and it can assist. And I know you're instrumental in, in providing input that helps really with our strategic planning mm -hmm. for the future, taking input from customers, from even end users with those 2,000 or 375 calls. Is there a mechanism that you're logging the content in these that can help provide feedback to the organization? Yeah, certainly. So we track, of course, uh, call type and then um, product inquiries, and we take the notes on it. So uh, we also have uh, trending issues, if you will. Um, issues might be a strong word, but yeah. uh, trending topics as well. And once we see a critical mass or understand a baseline, um, we will then work with product development, operations, uh, quality and regulatory, whomever is needed to take that data to them and to help understand and, and digest and triage the process to look for, is there a solution we need to implement? Um, is there a fix that needs to happen? And, and really to investigate and understand that. So we do track all of that. We have the numbers and the data to support it. And then one thing, going back to proactive versus reactive, um, I really encouraged and asked that our team leads and our managers are are assertive in connecting with those folks throughout the organization to be a part of that process. So it's that feedback loop, but then also on the front end, uh, the decision making process as well to ensure that everything that we know, we see, we understand is infused in the decision making that Starkey has throughout its product development life cycle. That's fantastic because there's no better person to talk to about providing input on the fitting software than the hearing care professional. And I think your team is on the front lines because they get valuable ideas from the end users and from the professional regarding how we can get better. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we work with marketing and the communications team and the sales team. We've developed a very close relationship to understand what are those opportunities and how can we um, maybe message it better or speak about it better. Because to your point, the customer can tell you everything you want to know about how you want to talk about it and what you need to look at and influence, whether it's a design decision or just simple training and communication. So we want to be a part of that conversation. You know, I, I, I've talked about we're at the, the epicenter of ops and marketing or ops and market facing, uh, but we're also one of the big four of market development, sales, training, marketing and customer service. Mm -hmm. And we work very, very closely to ensure that all the content that we put out, the things that we discuss, the internal updates, the communication we have with our teams is all focused on getting the right information at the right time so that we can in turn um, speak to our customers and help them out as efficiently as possible. And that's all part of that loop of taking that feedback, understanding what's happening with those 2000 calls a day, aggregating it, discussing it, and then getting it out. So hopefully everybody's having a much better experience as we go along. 
Excellent. Well, as usual, um, time is short on this. Uh, we, we have so much and you shared a lot about the organization and structure of your part of the organization, a very big, like you said, one of the big four on the market development group side. And I think really central to uh, Starkey's success is that customer service support. The tenure on your team, you mm -hmm. talked about the number of people, the, the average tenure, and I think many people uh, come into the organization through customer service. I know mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's a frustration is that, you know, they, 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 they come to the company through customer service and then they, they grow in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so talk about the average tenure. Yeah. Talk about how you measure success in sure. your organization. Well, you, you raised a good point with the um, maybe the mentality that, especially here over the years, that customer service might have been viewed as a um, maybe an entry level or an opportunity to get your foot in the door, right? And then move on, you know, often sales, marketing, et cetera. One of the things that I really wanted to change and shift um, in terms of culture and our people development was getting them to stay as career service professionals. Yes. So we revisited how we interview, how we hire, how we train, and how we develop people and provide them opportunities to grow new skills within customer service. And, and so that it's not viewed simply as, okay, I'm going to put in my two years here and then I'm going to move on because there's a great value in investing in them up front and having them stay. There's a value to us and there's certainly a value to our customers to have those seasoned veterans. And, you know, we have many who have served with us with Starkey for over 20, 25 and even 30 years. And we're very, very proud of that. We obviously have some others who are uh, who have just joined the team. But through our interview and recruiting process, we've identified people who view this as a career path, a career opportunity mm -hmm. in which to stay and grow in, in their skill set. So that's been a big cultural shift. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's absolutely been a focus of what we want to do to um, you know, lower that turnover rate and, and create that consistency among the team by providing them opportunities for promotion, for growth, for joining different teams within the CS umbrella. And we've seen a lot of success. In fact, we just had a department uh, update, I believe, last week where I shared over a half a dozen folks who had moved up in their journey to different teams. They've grown their skill set, uh, learned new things and shifted over to help us in new ways. And we want to take care of those high performers in, in both the challenges and the, and the reward for their commitment and dedication. And most importantly, we want to keep them because they're the best at helping our customer too, rather than having them get frustrated, move on, and we have to go hire someone else. So it's absolutely been a big focus. I'm really proud of the tenure that we have. I don't know the exact average, but if I did the quick math, I mean, it's easily over a dozen years yeah. on average um, when you look at the department as a whole. And that's something that we're very, very proud of. And we want to look to maintain easy, even as begrudgingly, a lot of those veterans <laughs> will decide that, you know, retirement approaches and, and they decide to move on to a different chapter. But I think you've done a great job of establishing a career path, mm -hmm. as you said, where people want to be focused on that mm -hmm. customer and, and really identify that as a home because it is so central to our organization's success. And I think for our customers listening to this and thinking about the size of their organization, mm -hmm. You know, there's always some new trend or new approach for, for business and, and business books and the latest flavor of the month. But mm -hmm. I think both Starkey and another organization that I work for, Mayo Clinic, have been, uh, you know, Starkey's is serving our customers better than anybody else. Mayo is the needs of the patient are the only interests mm -hmm. that matter. I think fundamentally, if you focus on exactly what your team is focused mm -hmm. on, the, the customer, and, and ensuring that their journey is a successful and happy mm -hmm. one, um, everything else finds a way of working it out. And I mean, I know Mr. Austin established this when he started the company in 67, and Brandon mm -hmm. is relentlessly mm -hmm. focused on serving the needs of the customer. And I think you have really picked that mm -hmm. up and carried it to another level. Well, it speaks to the the value that Starkey places, the importance we place upon developing relationships. You know, we don't pursue transactions, we cultivate mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. And any listener who's been to maybe a Hearing Innovation Expo, an on-campus event here at our headquarters in Eden Prairie, or anything else that we've facilitated, 
you know the value we place on the experience and the relationship with those customers. And so having folks who stay within the organization on the phones, interacting with customers for a long period of time, you're, of course, developing and strengthening that relationship. And that can help. That's mutually beneficial. Of course, it, it benefits the customer and those listening, but it helps us to have those longstanding relationships, too, of course. It can help you weather the uncertain times. It, it can help you with maybe a little more patience when a release or something doesn't go quite as planned. They understand the humans behind the company, and, and they're proud to be a part of it, despite maybe a bump along the way. Hopefully, there are a few, but... It happens from time to time. And one of my favorite things is when we have uh, customers on campus, as we will um, here soon after after we're recording, uh, they'll walk through the customer service area and they will see and, you know, people and call them out by name and give them a hug. And, you know, I think as we reflect on all of us being consumers in our own right, when was the last time you felt compelled to hug a customer service representative yeah. in another environment? But it happens routinely when folks are on campus here because they know and they place a high amount of value on that relationship and that service that we provide. Yeah, I think it'll be a relief to many of our listeners to know that uh, despite the uh, growth of open AI and chatbots, <laughs> you're not planning on replacing that human touch anytime soon with uh, natural language processing and voice AI, where you hit on it earlier. Empathy mm -hmm. is something yet that we yeah. haven't broken the barrier no, with we AI. To robots. And so, so you're going to, your team is going to continue to answer calls and serve our customers with a human. I knew we wouldn't make it the whole time without <laughs> talking about AI. Yeah. Um, is there a place for it? Absolutely. Sure. Will it replace what we do in our model? Absolutely not. Um, you know, one of the journeys that we've taken in terms of uh, internal systems and tools transformation is updating our CRM, making the platform more consistent, more scalable globally, and enhancing its features and, and streamlining a lot of um, the work that our, our agents used to have to do on multiple tools. It has AI components, but it won't replace who answers the phone, who responds to that email, that text. Um, it can augment and support. Um, we have a lot of, as you can imagine, complexity of information, whether it's product, policies, or services that we provide. And so, you know, you can leverage AI tools within these existing platforms that we have to make that interaction even more efficient, but that doesn't replace the human voice. And that's something that, uh, you know, Brandon and I have talked about, of yeah. course, is, you know, no matter what happens and comes down the pipeline with the advancement of the AI era, we're not going to change who we are fundamentally and, and what we do with the human voice uh, the live agent on the phone with that smiling that smiling face, and um, so there, there's a there's a place for it absolutely to augment what you do, but it certainly won't replace. Excellent. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that because <laughs> I enjoy very much all of your team members when I interface with them, oh, and I do so with regularity. Yeah. So um, one last closing comment. Then thinking mm. about serving our customers better than anyone else. We talked a little bit about some of the metrics, some of mm -hmm. the best practices, some of the ways that you do this on a large scale, but bringing it down to the professional in a private practice, mm -hmm. in a small business. Any final words of advice from your role uh, on this big stage, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. as to how they can bring it to their practice? Well, I would say it's similar to what I had said before in terms of proximity to the customer, mm -hmm. or in this case, the patient. If you can understand and prioritize their journey from that initial phone call that you mentioned, you know, that often starts the process, establishing what they might expect, understanding what they might need and their concerns so that you are ready for them when they do show up. It can help eliminate that no-show rate that I know some struggle with. But understanding that journey every step along the way and how does how is their happiness impacted by what you do, the decisions you make, how your staff presents themselves um, in, during that interaction, and then the follow-up too, of course. Because um, you know we know that the cost of acquiring a new patient is six times or more than just to retain a current one. So if you can provide, you know, deliver on the basic fundamentals, uh, deliver on what's expected, and then provide some areas of exceptional experiences and retain them and have them as loyal customers or patients in this case, 
um, that will pay dividends. And then they are sharing that with their friends, their loved ones when they might seek help as well. And, and, and it goes back to, you know, invest now to save later. Right. Do it right the first time. Take the time to understand it. And I mentioned before, too, I mean, we, we've had to look at I've you know hopped on the phones and gone through the, the journey and talked to our customers. There are things that, you know, might disappoint you about you know how, how it's operating in the practice. And that's OK. Recognize them and then don't be afraid to change it, to address it and to challenge the assumptions. And I think you'll find delivering an exceptional service and what patients expect and deserve um, is not that far out of reach. Wonderful. Well said. And I think we'll leave it there. Chris, I really appreciate your coming on the podcast to share this information. Uh, your team has to be so well versed in so many areas and, and that triage, but ultimately the empathy that comes with the human voice really defines Starkey and, uh, and you're the embodiment of that. So thank you. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And, you know, it takes an organization. So nothing that we achieve in our department could be accomplished without the support and, and the partnership with every area of the organization, as I stressed before. But we're excited about where we are and even more excited about where we're going. Love it. Right. And uh, again, I'll reiterate uh, thanks to our listeners and our, our, our viewers, for those who are watching on the YouTube channel. Um, if you liked this episode, like us, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode, share it with your friends, bring some of those ideas back to your practice so that ultimately you can transition this to serve your customers better than anybody else in your market. Uh, if you have ideas uh, about future topics, send us an email at soundbites at starkey.com. And until then, uh, we'll look to see and hear you really soon.